Hello, fellow detectives. Welcome to Unlocked, the official podcast for all things Nancy Drew by Her Interactive. I'm your host, Tammy Tucky, and this week we welcome creative director and voiceover artist, Max Holacek, to the show. Welcome, Max. Hi, Tammy. It's great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you because I didn't realize you had all these credits with Nancy Drew uh, because originally I remember you as the voice of Nicholas Falcone in the final scene, which is like my favorite side character from the older games. So I was like, you're a creative director on a lot of these early Nancy Drew games, which kind of just, just you, you're filled with surprises, Max. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad somebody thinks so. How did you get into being a creative director for her interactive initially? Well, um, it probably didn't hurt that I have a film and theater background. And so when they were looking for somebody to replace their art director, um, I think my background uh, appealed to them. Um, Also, I had previously worked at Humongous Entertainment as the executive producer for their websites, which um, at the time... I was um, bringing more, uh, I was shaping the project product, uh, the website into kind of an online destination for kids that would sort of rival what um, Club Penguin was doing. And uh, unfortunately, the, the company, um, uh, the parent company for Humongous went bankrupt before we could see that to fruition. But I think a combination of um, that, uh, those skills help uh, uh, gave me the nod into becoming the the art director, and then about six months later, um, I uh, I had a title change to creative director. Well, the first game that I was able to work on from soup to nuts was the final scene. Um, Treasure of the Royal Tower was the game, my, my, the first game that I worked on. I came in about halfway through the production, where everything was pretty much already set up, and my job was to uh, just keep the the original vision going uh to the end and um and so i can't take a whole lot of credit for that one but i did i was able to take advantage of the uh uh the time to just sort of see how the the team worked um how the 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 production um uh worked with the different departments uh collaborating together and i was able to sort of get a heads up of what my experience would be like uh, working on a a game where uh, I was able to sort of create the foundation. Let's see, the Nicholas Falcone story is probably uh, somebody's um, story of their miserable experience with her interactive. Uh, So we brought, uh, we we auditioned a bunch of actors and um, we uh, we selected the actor to... um, fill the roles for all of the characters but only once we were done and we were getting ready to animate all of the characters we we were able to sort of listen to the voices within the context of how the game was coming together and uh unfortunately we the writer and I felt like you know this 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 voice does not quite capture the 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 Falcone as as he was written, as as uh, Aaron Brown, our brilliant writer, sort of imagined him. And uh, the more we talked about it, the more we were sort of um, just sort of wringing our hands because we realized we didn't have the budget to go out and record somebody else. So um, I just started doing uh, a Nick Falcone voice for her. And she said, yeah, yeah, that's it. Let's just do that. So... Um, we uh, we went back into the studio and I did the the Nick voice and that's how it came together. We had no idea that uh, those games between Treasure in the Royal Tower up through, oh I don't know what is it like um, uh, Secret of Shadow Ranch, uh, those have sort of gone on to be to be held as sort of. Um, the the very appreciated sort of string of games and we didn't have that feedback back then um so i think that if we had the idea it's like well let's bring back a character you know we might 
we probably would have held back on it thinking that it would be maybe too much of an in joke or that we would be only we'd only be entertaining ourselves instead of truly doing try to do something for the fans we had no idea that the fans would actually appreciate it uh, but certainly if um, the the crew who is who are in charge of the games right now if they ever had a, a whim to bring back one of the old characters I'd be happy to help out and I think you can answer this question for me about the final scene in particular because I remember playing it maybe like three months back because I was trying to go through all the games and, and remember you know certain things because I hadn't played them in a long time. But there's this part where you go up the stairs and there are fake movie posters along the way. And I can mm-hmm. swear to you that one of them is a resemblance of the Emperor's New Groove poster. Do you know <laughs> anything about this? Is this an inside joke? It has to be. Oh, um, yeah, there were little uh, silly inside jokes or crazy little parodies, I think, throughout uh, the games that at least I worked on. And through this interview, uh, just for clarification, those are the only games I'll be able to speak to um, that I have sort of any insight on. But uh, yeah, there was silliness going on all the time in, in those games. And I apologize in advance for our listeners. I forgot to list all of your credits. So, again, as you said, you did uh, Treasure in the Royal Tower. That was your first one. And then you did uh, the final scene, Secret of the Scarlet Hand, Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake, The Haunted Carousel, Danger on Deception Island, The Secret of the Shadow Ranch, and Curse of Black Boar Manor, which was your last one. So that's like eight games within the period of only four and a half years. Was it really hard to like push two slash three of these games out, you know, maybe every other year? Yeah, uh, it really was. Uh, when we were working on Treasure in the Royal Tower, uh, that game was... Um, Oh, probably just had a couple of months left uh, on the production when the game distributors at the time were sort of at war with each other and they're trying to undercut each other on the prices of games. And as a result, all the game distributors at this time decided that they were going to start selling children's titles for $19.99, no matter uh, what the, the companies that that you know developed the games sort of needed the games to be priced at in order to keep their business plan and their business model intact and we were one of the companies that once we received the news we didn't know what to do um i remember the day megan geyser the president of uh her interactive at the time brought me into her office and she told me this news and she said max this leaves us really with two choices Uh, One is to figure out how we can um, double our output two games a year or we we close up the shop. There's just really nothing else we can do. What do you think? And I had only been there for a little while. I had only been there for a a few months. And so being the uh, go getter that I uh, have a history of being, uh, I said, well, we know what's going to happen if we. if we don't try. So let's, let's go for it. And, um, I, uh, I was, uh, I was influential in getting, um, the company set up to a point that, uh, we started to create two games a year. Uh, I figured out how to restructure the teams to stagger two productions at once. Um, I reshuffled the art team, um, at, in such a way that we were, we'll, able to work more efficiently. Um, I was the person in charge of selecting books that I thought would allow us to meet an aggressive schedule. Um, And um, I was able to pull a lot of experience from my filmmaking and my theater days in order to punch up the games on levels so that the games maybe would be smaller in scope, maybe would have smaller environments or a smaller number of environments, but it was my goal to make these games that went from a six months or a 12 month production cycle down to a six month production cycle, make them feel as large as the the games that had come um, before them. And um, I, I took the man that, I took that goal very seriously because I understood that 
I really took to heart the the Nancy Drew IP. Uh, she's, you know, Nancy is a a culturally important um, icon, and we have fans that you know go back generations. We have you know moms handing off the books to their daughters and you know and then those daughters becoming moms and like playing the games when they came out with their daughters and so it was important that we we just do it right in the face of this <laughs> crazy challenge and um and i have to say um well I, honestly I, I was never sure if if we really uh, did right until years and years later, I started getting, uh, feedback and emails from, from fans who would, uh, uh, seek me out because they saw that, uh, my name was attached to, to, uh, that specific line of games. And, uh, only then did I realize just, um, how, uh, how much they love the games and, and that, that a particular uh, series of games and just how much they meant to them. So, um, it, it really, uh, it really felt good hearing that after so many years. But anyway, that was a long winded way of saying, yes, it was, it was quite a challenge when I was creating, uh, when I was kind of cobbling together the, the main story and, and the, the, the characters and, you know, their transformations and their arcs and whatnot. Um, one thing that I always appreciated as a kid um, were the the movies or the the shows that were geared towards kids that did not pander to us, did not pander to our age, and knew that um, we were capable of of sort of ingesting concepts that were you know a little more advanced. Otherwise, you know, it's it feels we all remember being kids and watching the programs where we're, you know, we get bumped out of the program because we feel like, I really feel like they're talking down to me or this is for babies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we all have that. And, and I really remember appreciating the shows that, that spoke to me like a, more like a young adult. And I think that that was sort of the filter, um, that, uh, I was using in creating the stories. I wanted to create something that was a little spooky. I want, I didn't shy away from, um, having, you know, good guys and bad guys with really sort of complex backgrounds and complex issues. Now, did I take it too far? You know, I think it probably depends on the adult that you're talking to. Um, well, I think uh, that's what makes them so memorable, too, because you know that there are stakes and that what you're doing does count for something because, you know, it is a game. But then again, you are learning certain things along the way. That's great. It's it's really great to hear how uh, the 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 work that we, we spent, the time that we spent in making uh, really compelling stories and, and well, you know, hopefully uh, and, and compelling characters do. Um, did make an impact because like I said, we were sort of feeding a, a vacuum at the time and we were just doing our best and hoping that we were doing something that uh, would be looked back upon as, um, you know, a, a proud moment within the, uh, the Nancy Drew lineage. And another way that we uh, really understood our audience is we know that um, this is a, a kind of a, a, a gross sort of generalization, so I apologize in advance. But um, if you have a, a male player and a female character, or if, uh, a male player and a female player, and uh, you give them both a section of a game where they have to go through, say, a conversation tree, generally, again, it's a gross generalization, but generally, the guy is going to race through it and just get the basics of what he needs and then get out, whereas a female player will take her time and really sort of explore that conversation tree and really get to know uh, the character and, and, and really try to suss out every last detail. What do they really know? Well, and we knew that, and we appreciated that, and we appreciated the fact that uh, our female characters were really more in tune gross generalization to uh to that sort of social interaction so i think that we felt comfortable um taking risks and doing things that were um really had a a, a deeper emotional impact like the robot that had the voice of the father we just knew that we 
had an audience that would um, that that would strike a chord with. So it was it was fun to actually come up with stuff like that to um, to entertain the fans in new and unusual ways. And not only is the animation a, a strong component into telling the story, but also the music is. And I really wanted to know what one of your favorite scores from the games that you worked on was like something right. that really was like, oh, you know what? We're in this environment. We're in this world. And I and I love it. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I'll take this moment to uh, give Kevin Manthe a shout out. Um, working with him was a, an absolute joy. Uh, just a super, super nice, super talented guy. And um, he was able to uh, nail every diverse genre that we had Nancy in in every game. Um, just uh, just perfected. And um, that was another thing that we really consciously tried to do as the fans could, you know, probably have no problem identifying that um, there was so there was so much that we did have to reuse uh, in each game, like put just put a new spin or a new skin on an old puzzle mechanic, uh, for instance, um, that uh, we I try to change the genre between each games pretty radically. And um, and Kevin was able to, like I said, meet those genre switches just just superbly. And I think my favorite they were all so good, but I think that my favorite may have been um, the Secret of Shadow Ranch. Um, uh, I challenged him with a really sort of diverse palette of of um, different types of music. I think there was there was like Wild West music, and there was I think sort of like a like Native American inspired uh, traditional sounding pieces. Um, there was you know, the general mystery on the ranch sort of music. And then there was this one that um, I asked him to do when Nancy is out in the middle of the desert, um, when she's sort of on horseback and she's between destinations and sort of in the middle of nowhere. And I think at some point we find that there's a scorpion maze or something under a rock. Um, but it's just a 360 empty uh, desert sort of scene. And I had asked him to come up with something that was sort of a, like a lone David Gilmore esque guitar, um, uh, against sort of this very sort of, um, bed of, of yawning nothingness. And he knew exactly what I was, uh, trying to describe. And the, um, the track that he provided for that scene, um, is just absolutely it, it it exceeded my expectations and when i uh first saw the scene all sort of linked together and and that music's just sort of like faded in i got literal goosebumps it was it was really fun to see that come together there have been so many games that have come out since then and and you've moved on to do other projects and what have you been most up to lately are you still working as a creative director uh i am actually and um i'm I've scaled back a bit, and instead of working for uh, larger companies, I am working for um, individuals. Um, right now, I'm working with somebody uh, who um, is uh, providing a, an outreach to millennials to uh, and to sort of give them the the tools that they require to become young entrepreneurs, um, creating uh, conscious businesses, and um, it's it's something that I'm really passionate about and really thankful to be uh, uh, working on. And that has me um, doing a lot of uh, video production and post-production, web design, um, copy editing, just a little bit of everything. So um, yeah, yet yet another job that allows me to sort of dip into my, my whole uh, career long experience and after the Nancy Drew games, uh, I worked on a few more. I did. Um, I just found myself working on a few um, restaurant games. Um, so I did uh, the second and third game in the 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 Turbo games. Um, Turbo, the sequel to Turbo Pizza. What were they? It was um, uh, Turbo Subs and um, and then what was it? Wasn't we couldn't call it Turbo Burrito because that was voted down, but uh, uh, t Turbo Fiesta, that's what it was called. I was really proud of those, um, of all of the resource management, running around, making food and serving people. I felt like um, ours um, really 
up the ante and we got a great great response from those and so i think that that's uh, alongside nancy drew those are probably the uh, the other games that i'm most proud of and speaking of your legacy my last question is always the same to everyone who is a part of the nancy drew her interactive universe so if you could describe your experience becoming a part of the nancy drew universe using one word what would that be i think again it would be thankful um uh, i don't think any of us at that time had uh, any idea that uh, the games would end up having the following that they do. And um, I've been in the industry long enough to know that um, that is uh, definitely the exception and not the rule. Uh, that's something that you create uh, really uh, generates a, a lot of excitement and continues to generate that excitement long after it's been shipped. So uh, I'm just really, really thankful that um, – you know, the long hours and, and the hard work that we all put into those games um, not only made for a, a good release for that year, but uh, continues to, you know, uh, bring people happiness uh, years after its release. 